Welcome to the Cities of Migration Learning Exchange. Today's webinar explores the topic, Building Inclusive Cities. What is a welcoming standard? Advancing the art of welcome, the Australian standard for welcoming cities is a new framework for helping local councils benchmark their cultural diversity and inclusion policies and practices, identify gaps, set goals, and assess their progress over time. Looking to the future, the standard challenges city and community leaders to work collaboratively towards a shared vision of a welcoming and inclusive nation. Today, we'll learn more about the change-making work behind welcoming cities, the design and implementation of the Australian standard, and what it's doing to ensure immigrants thrive across the social, economic, and civic life of their cities. We are joined today by leaders in the sector. I, I am delighted to welcome today's guests. All the way from Brisbane, Australia, we are joined by Alim Ali, who is National Manager of Welcoming Cities. And joining us from um, Edmonton in Western Canada, we have Darren Reedy, Manager of Welcoming and Inclusive Communities at the Alberta Urban Municipalities Association. Let's uh, start by introducing our guest speaker. Alim Ali is National Manager of the Australian Initiative Welcoming Cities. Welcoming Cities works with local governments in Australia to develop evidence-based strategies that increase participation and a sense of belonging among all Australians, both in local communities and on a national scale. In 2017, Welcoming Cities launched the Australian Standard, enabling local councils to benchmark their cultural diversity and inclusion policies, practices, and assess progress over time. Awarded and recognized for his contribution to the community, Alim has spent the past 20 years seeding and mentoring the development of leading programs, initiatives, and enterprises. He is a mentor and advisor to various startups, community enterprises, and government panels, and a respected presenter on issues related to cultural diversity and social cohesion. And as a cultural and social entrepreneur, Alim loves little more than working with passionate people to implement great ideas that advance the common good. We are very happy to have you with us here today, Alim. Uh, welcome. The podium is yours. Thanks, Kim, and uh, thanks to your team in the Cities of Migration for this great opportunity. Um, and thanks to Darren, too, for, for making himself available. Um, Greetings, uh, good morning or good evening, depending on which time zone in the world you are. Um, quite honoured and humbled to have this opportunity. Um, and uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I'm presenting today on the lands of the Turrbal and Yuggera people of Mianjin, otherwise known as Brisbane, Australia, and, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, at Welcoming Cities, we, we really believe that it's absolutely vital that First Nations peoples, as the traditional owners and, and traditional custodians, are involved in welcoming work and that we increasingly seek to support and facilitate dialogue between Indigenous and migrant communities. Um, and so to begin, uh, I'm just going to zoom out a little bit um, and possibly tell you stuff that you may already know, but I just want to talk briefly about why we might need something like the Welcoming Cities Initiative and a standard and accreditation process for migration, settlement, cultural diversity and inclusion that uh, in terms of our work has a particular focus on local governments um, and municipalities. So currently almost 250 million people live and reside outside their current country of birth and I guess whilst refugees and people seeking asylum have essentially become the face of migration certainly in Australia in the media and political discourse, the reality is that 90% of the world's 250 million migrants uh, are moving across board borders, not by force, not for sheer survival, um, but voluntarily for work or family reunion. And, and it is essentially this move of people that has really underpinned the nation-building philosophy, the policy framework and demographic reality of Australia. Australia's really uh, benefited and continues to benefit from the hard work and determination of, of generations of migrants. Broadly speaking, uh, Australians enjoy one of the highest standards of living in the world and one of the highest levels of social cohesion. And this really exists in the context of one of the highest percentages of cultural diversity per capita anywhere in the world. 
And so um, what we know, or what we think we know, is that over the next 35 years, it's anticipated that migration will maintain sustainable population growth and drive economic and skills growth in Australia. It's projected that migration will contribute approximately $1.6 trillion to Australia's GDP and that migrants will contribute 10% more to the economy um, and increase the education standards vastly more than established residents. But there are really kind of two big challenges facing Australian cities, towns and, and centres at the moment, and, and that is that the, they are either grappling with rapid growth or kind of trying to deal with significant decline. So um, approximately 100 regional and rural towns and centres across Australia are facing significant population and economic decline. And in this context, migration and settlement can potentially solve a massive problem. And so migration is linked to really their very survival and it can help regional towns and centres to increase local populations, to add to the cultural vibrancy, to revitalise local businesses and services and uh, attract increased funding and investment. However, uh, it's not as easy as it might sound or seem because there really is also an issue of uh, what we would call perception and attraction. And what we're trying to address is how we attract people to rural and regional centres. And there is this perception issue that um, relates to some growing and what I would call concerning trends. Um, the latest Social Cohesion Index, which is produced by the Scanlon Foundation in Australia and Monash University, um, really offers a combination of good news and bad news for us in Australia. The good news is that the vast majority of Australians still readily agree that Australia is a multicultural success story. Um, the bad news is really tied to the bottom line in that graph, the kind of mauvey purple line that's taking a rapid dip, um, which is what we call uh, the acceptance and legitimacy domain. And that plummeted by 15 points in the past uh, 12 to 18 months. And what this declining purple line tells us is that negative views of migration and experiences of discrimination have uh, significantly increased in our country. And, and that's concerning. And, and it's, con it's a concerning shift um, that is really primarily tied um, to narrative. And we don't have to look very far in this country or, or even globally to, to find a narrative of fear of, of uh, migrants depriving long-term residents of jobs, of refugees leeching off taxpayers and newcomers bringing radical ideologies. It's, it's a strong narrative. It's a compelling narrative. It, it attracts clicks. It attracts advertising revenue on media sites. It gets some politicians elected in our country. Um, it's a false narrative. It's wrong. But it's really beginning to chip away at the social cohesion of our communities. And so this narrative of fear causes multiculturalism, migration and welcoming to be viewed with nervousness, to, to be viewed with suspicion. And, and the consequences are, are twofold. Uh, firstly, that receiving communities become less welcoming and in some instances really quite resistant and uh, aggressive towards migrant communities. And secondly, that migrant communities in turn then become more insular and, and less likely to move to areas where economic opportunity might exist. And so there's really a clear sense that the Australian multicultural success story is increasingly at risk. And I guess that kind of creates a range of challenges, but it also creates opportunities. And we're really kind of grappling with the question at the moment, who do we want to be? And uh, once we kind of talk about and understand the values behind that, who we want to be, then how do we actually get there? And so because of the need to answer this question, to to change the narrative and to find solutions, uh, Welcoming Cities was birthed. Um, and it was founded uh, a little less than two years ago. We're still very much um, a, a new uh, entity. We're still very much in startup phase. Um, we uh, began as a partnership between the Scanlon Foundation, uh, quite a leading philanthropic organisation in Australia, and Welcome to Australia, a national NGO, uh, along with the support and advice of uh, Welcoming America in the States. We're a not-for-profit and we sit alongside 
um, uh, a framework called the National Settlement Framework, which was developed by the Australian Government through the Department of Social Services. And the National Settlement Framework, and more recently uh, another uh, federal government document, the uh, Australian Multicultural Statement, really kind of offer a high-level blueprint for migration and settlement in this country. Um, and they have a specific focus on our three tiers of government, federal, state, and local. And this is then supported by um, various settlement services and agencies that you can probably see on your screen, and also peak bodies such as the Federation of Ethnic Communities Councils of Australia, the Settlement Council of Australia, uh, and the Refugee Council of Australia. Um, but part of our kind of focus on local government was a recognition that, that really of all tiers of government, local councils um, are, are best placed to understand the complexity and the diversity of their communities and really to invite um, all local key stakeholders to the table. But local government who have been really traditionally expected to focus on um, almost exclusively on what we call the three R's, roads, rates and rubbish, uh, really kind of have limited resources and limited support in engaging in the migration, settlement, cultural diversity and inclusion space. And so in the past few years we've seen in this country the establishment of important initiatives and campaigns such as Racism It Stops With Me from the Australian Human Rights Commission and Refugee Welcome Zones from the Refugee Council of Australia. Um, they're really important. They're really important for messaging. They're really important for highlighting values and culture. But what campaigns and initiatives can't do and aren't designed to do is really provide that framework for determining benchmarks and determining whether we're actually being successful over time or not. Um, and, and so our vision at Welcoming Cities is an, a network of welcoming and cohesive cities and regions where everyone can belong and participate in social, economic and civic life. Uh, our mission is around supporting local councils and community leaders to leverage the ideas and innovation that come from being welcoming and inclusive. Um, because what we know is that welcoming works, it, it attracts people to communities, it, it draws talent, it, it grows business opportunities. When people feel uh, a sense of value and belonging, when they feel welcome, they will participate in community life. But we also know that welcome really is more than a nice idea or a banner-waving exercise. It, it needs to be a framework. It needs to be a framework for building social, economic and civic participation and success. And, and so our objectives are really focused on that, focused on ensuring that um, receiving communities are welcoming and provide supported opportunities to engage migrant communities, that, that local councils really do have comprehensive plans and, and active messaging for cultural diversity in, and inclusion in their policy, in multi-sector engagement, in uh, the activities that they do and their economic development approaches uh, to ensure that local councils and community stakeholders really have an articulated case for, for why this work is important um, and networks and resources that facilitate effective planning for welcoming and inclusion. And also to, to really support local councils to, to facilitate a whole of community approach to building social and cultural inclusion, economic engagement and civic participation. And so I think in some ways, which is probably the focus of a lot of uh, the work of people who are, who are listening in today, um, we're, we're striving to reach what we call the promised land, uh, communities in which everyone can have a sense of value and belonging. But as we know, this, this is not easily reached. And so what we're really trying to do is look at how do we build a framework around campaigns, projects and initiatives and policies and practices and, and how do we highlight leading practice and share and celebrate that. You know, how do we benchmark and advance this work? Uh, and so we're working essentially to create a national network um, that has international links uh, of cities, shires, towns, municipalities, and really kind of support them in the four key areas that, that are there on your screen around knowledge sharing, uh, sharing leading uh, both local but also global policy and practice within councils, across departments, and, and also across the entire network, uh, developing resources that showcase leading work. Uh, we recently worked with one of our member cities, Hume City Council, to develop a handbook for local councils titled uh, Local Jobs for Local People, uh, which will actually be launched next week. Um, and, and that uh, resource documents 
um, essentially their outstanding efforts in addressing local unemployment and also articulating how other uh, local councils or municipalities can implement similar work. Um, partnership development, linking councils and community stakeholders, uh, linking councils with other councils, linking mayors and CEOs with uh, international councils and summits. Um, celebrating success, which is really important to our work, showcasing leading practice and celebrating the great work that's already happening uh, and the efforts and stories of communities. And the final element uh, is really uh, this standard and accreditation piece, which um, we've really seen in many ways is really kind of bridging the largest gap um, around that kind of benchmarking and framework. And so. The Australian Standard for Welcoming Cities really exists to provide that framework for local councils and community stakeholders to, to develop and benchmark cultural diversity and inclusion policies and practices across every single thing that they do, um, to identify where and how further efforts could be directed, and to really begin to assess um, and monitor and evaluate their progress over time. It's ambitious work. Um, this will likely be the first internationally accredited standard for migration settlement culturally, sorry, cultural diversity and inclusion uh, anywhere in the world. Um, and even though we're relatively kind of new, we've really undertaken quite an iterative process that essentially began with really identifying the need and mapping all the stakeholders, uh, both locally, nationally and globally. Um, we developed the term, uh, terms of reference and then kind of began this process of communicating with as many stakeholders as possible uh, in, by as many means as possible uh, and, and really just inviting them to engage in the, in the development of an Australian standard for cultural diversity and inclusion um, and migration and settlement, uh, including the establishment of a working group and advisory committee that included uh, and includes a, a lot of the sort of stakeholders that I showed on the, on the previous landscape map. Uh, we engaged a consulting firm, Deloitte, uh, initially to, to really just kind of develop the content for a public draft that was based primarily on desktop research and the work of um, some great organisations, including Cities of Migration uh, through the MICOM Diagnostic, uh, the work of Welcoming America, Intercultural Cities, Euro Cities, who'd all developed their own uh, methodologies or standards. And so we had uh, a great platform of work to build from and a lot of the challenge for us was really in formulating the draft around language, uh, terminology and context um, and recognising that the system of government in Australia uh, is somewhat different to that of the United States and that the language and terminology uh, that we use around immigration, multiculturalism, interculturalism, diversity and inclusion kind of has its own Australianisms, I guess, its own uh, nuances and differences, and also recognising that across 537 local government authorities in Australia, there is uh, something of a complexity and diversity of demography, capacity, resource allocation and service delivery. And so six months after we began this process, we launched our first public draft for consultation and feedback, uh, which happened in March this year. Um, we had quite an overwhelmingly positive response, um, which I think in part is a testament to our initial consultation. Uh, we received approximately 150 detailed submissions uh, in the four months that the consultation period was open. And this was sourced online, in forums, uh, through teleconferences, in discrete workshops uh, that we conducted across the country. And then we went through a process of really kind of filtering and applying that feedback to produce uh, a few other iterations that we then put back to our stakeholders, um, not necessarily kind of to the whole country this time, but uh, back to our key stakeholders. And then we, from there we received uh, approximately another 20 detailed submissions in response to that iteration. Um, so we're now up to version 1.76. Uh, our intention is to launch version 2.0, uh, which isn't very creative, but kind of what we do, um, which will be the published standard at our next national symposium on the 23rd of March next year. Um, and just to kind of highlight some of the, I guess, key elements of the standard, um, which is available uh, publicly online in terms of the current iteration, um, 
what we're trying to do is, is allow councils in a relatively accessible and user-friendly manner to, to really kind of assess the work that they're doing to advance welcoming and inclusion work um, and develop relatively straightforward strategies for both receiving and migrant communities and the intersection of those communities. And so that's very much our strategic focus. Um, the standard at the moment is organised under six broad categories um, that broadly encompass the work that, that local councils and community leaders do around leadership, uh, economic development, uh, civic participation uh, and social and cultural inclusion. Um, and because we're trying to create a standard that works for the diversity of 537 local councils in Australia, um, we've articulated different stages and levels at which councils can be accredited. Um, and so the entry level to that is what we're calling established, which only requires that a council meets all the criteria and indicators of the first category, which is leadership. And this stage is um, likely to be just uh, self-assessed um, with sign-off from our team. Um, and then advanced must meet the first three criteria, uh, sorry, three categories uh, of the standard, and that is peer assessed. Uh, and then excelling and mentoring um, must meet um, varying degrees of all six categories of the standard, which then requires an external audit uh, as the means of assessment and accreditation. And so in terms of that, we're working um, with Monash University, who done a lot of work in the social cohesion space over the last decade um, in relation to monitoring and evaluation, and they will likely take on the role of external auditor. And we're also working with them to consider uh, something probably a little bit similar to, to the work of um, the MICOM diagnostic in allowing um, any council in Australia to really give themselves a high level sense of how they're sitting against the standard before they commit to the process. Um, we're aware that um, for any government body, perception is really important and so we don't want to put councils in a position where they engage with the process and are then found to be so wanting that it sheds them or kind of showcases them in a poor light and so we want to give them safe entry points to the standard um, where, uh, as I said, only been in existence uh, just under two years but we kind of believe it's an initiative whose time has come. We're, we're growing rapidly. Our current members are really quite diverse. Um, Ararat Rural City, for example, uh, known for its wool and its wine production, uh, has a population of approximately 11,000 people. Uh, the city of Hume, who, who is our first member city, which contains um, the Melbourne International and domestic airports, uh, has a population of approximately 200,000 people. Um, and we haven't necessarily uh, had a specific or strategic approach in terms of who we've targeted or specifically sought to target smaller cities. It's more been a process I guess, of the lowest hanging fruit and, and who expresses the most interest and intent uh, behind what we're doing. Uh, we're talking to all the major capital cities in this country, um, but their processes are understandably more involved and often take longer to work through. Um, and um, as I've noted on the slide there, we're currently, uh, in addition to the 12 mem member councils, approximately 61 local councils have expressed interest in getting involved in the network and what we're doing. Um, the, the standard has already had some flow on into other regions and opportunities as well. Uh, we're, we're currently consulting to and supporting the New Zealand Government on the development of their Welcoming Communities Standard, um, which is a really exciting initiative and pilot for that country. Uh, there's interest from sporting clubs and associations, including uh, the Australian Football League, in the development of a standard for welcoming clubs. Um, and we're really consulting heavily. We, we want this to be a network by, for and with local councils and local communities and so we recognise that this takes time and, and that a lot of people need to be brought to the table. Um, so just I guess to kind of wrap up before we get into the, the meaty questions, um, I really think that the continued success of Multicultural Australia will, will really depend on our ability to maintain, foster and support social cohesion in our communities as our population and cultural diversity continues to grow. And part of that work is really around ensuring that welcoming and inclusion is embedded, that, that it's embedded across local communities, that it's um, more than a banner-waving exercise, that it's underpinned by very clear strategic frameworks with 
the capacity to, to kind of benchmark and advance that work through a very clear and iterative process. And so our hope and intention is that Australia uh, would continue to lead the way amongst other nations in cultural diversity and inclusion, and, and that our social cohesion would continue to be enhanced rather than diminished. And that's really the heart of our work. Oh, thank you very much, Salim Ali, for that um, brilliant overview of the uh, Australian standard for welcoming cities. Um, an ambitious and, and uh, beautifully conceived project. I, I, it really, um, we hear a lot about cities as sort of engines of the national economy, but maybe not enough um, about cities as active nation builders. And uh, so I think that's something important for us all to think about, the importance of really engaging cities on on how to build the robust, reflective uh, democracies that our multicultural society really aspires to be. So thank you very much. Now, um, from Australia and, uh, of, of course, with uh, references to New Zealand and to the US, um, in New Zealand that's just piloted its own, uh, we see that welcoming cities is part of a growing international movement that supports local leaders and uh, communities to be more effective, open resilience is very exciting work. So what about Canada? So let's turn this conversation over to our second guest, Darren Reedy joins us from the city of Edmonton out in Alberta in Western Canada, where he has played a leading role um, in the sem earlier in the seminal work of the Canadian Coalition of Municipalities Against Racism and Discrimination, and where he's now developing cutting edge tools like the AUMA Measuring Inclusion Tool and its Welcoming and Inclusive Communities Toolkit. I'm delighted to introduce our guest interviewer. Um, Darren is the manager of the Welcoming and Inclusive Communities Program for the Alberta Urban Municipalities Association. He is responsible for providing strategic guidance, facilitating educational workshops, and promoting tools and resources that help municipal governments advance policies and practices to counter racism and discrimination in Alberta's communities. He is a certified management accountant with years of experience in the municipal sector in involving roles in human resources, economic development, recreation, uh, capital accounting, and government advocacy. Darren is a member of, a, of the advisory committee to the Canadian Coalition of Municipalities Against Racism and Discrimination, uh, which is a project of the Canadian Commission for UNESCO, and also the founder of Reedy Insights, a consultancy that delivers strategic planning, policy development, and financial analysis services to municipal governments and not-for-profit organizations in Western Canada. He's a busy man, and so we're very pleased to have him with us now. Welcome, Darren. The podium is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, it's really great to, to be able to profile the, the, the long-standing work of AUMA um, and to be able to, to hear Aline's work and uh, to be able to participate. So thank you again for this opportunity. Um, for, for perspective, um, the Alberta Urban Municipalities Association is, is um, in the Alberta context, I guess, serves as the single voice um, for cities, towns, villages, and summer villages and specialized municipalities in Alberta. Um, and we uh, have approximately 270 members representing communities of less than 100 to over over 1 million people. So our, our membership is broad, and so the work that we're doing in this area is, is broad. Um, and so I'm, I'm pleased to be here to be able to ask a few questions of Aleem and, and take some learnings from from uh, Australia's work. Uh, Aleem, for your knowledge, I'm going to try to premise some of my questions so you have a, some understanding of where we're coming from. Um, uh, as I mentioned, our, our members are, are very broad in size, and the issues and feel of each community is, is different. Um, in terms of immigration, we see trends where most um, immigrants are, are choosing to settle in seven of, the, of, of Alberta's major cities. And through my work, I often attend trade shows and events to promote our Inclusive Communities Initiative to, to get more members on board. Um, and during these events, I'll approach municipal leaders about the value of community inclusion 
And in some unfortunate cases, I've received a response that um, they stated to me, well, inclusion doesn't really apply to my community because we do not have immigrants. And I find those occurrences uh, somewhat challenging, as we know that issues of discrimination go beyond immigrants, uh, but it's often the target area. But we know there's m many other groups of people that are facing issues of, of racism and discrimination. So my question to you is, how do you open up a conversation with leaders in municipalities who maybe have not experienced the impact of migration and do not see the value that diversity and inclusion can bring to their community? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think at the very least that they're on the inside looking out at um, various perceptions of immigration uh, either positive or negative, and it's quite a polarised conversation in our country, as, as I'm sure it is in, in many others. Um, we're, we're also now in Australia post-mining boom and also kind of amidst something of a strained relationship between the mining and agriculture industries, um, and, and that's really placed our regional and rural areas, which, which tend to be our smaller municipalities, under quite a lot of stress. Um, there are, however, now numbers of relatively well-known examples and case studies of Australian towns, at least well-known sort of broadly in this country, um, who've embraced migration as a solution to um, population and economic decline, uh, city or the region of Neil, Dalwallanew, and, and kind of smaller cities such as the city of Darwin. And, and so I think probably for us the, the challenge is, is sometimes less in seeing uh, the potential value of, of migration and inclusion. Um, most of the rural municipalities and smaller municipalities kind of know that they need to attract people. Um, but the challenge is more how and who and trying to, to manage some of the perception issues, trying to manage um, the angry, fearful voices um, and, and trying to uh, address issues. We've got an issue at the moment where kind of political sense that welcome has become a dirty word, that, um, you know, that it seemed to be quite politically sensitive to, to use that word now because um, it, it might mean that, that, that others are going to come into our community through welcome. Um, um, and so there's, I think part of it is really initiating a conversation with uh, mayors, councillors, CEOs of, of local communities. Um, about what what their vision of a prosperous future looks like. What are they want? What are their hopes for their towns? What what are their hopes for their cities? Um, what might that look like? What might be required to make that happen? And so the starting point for us is never migration and inclusion. We don't kind of begin with that solution. It, it's more around uh, how can we help municipalities to understand what they want to achieve, who they want to be, and then kind of help them to get there and. We know that migration and, and, and uh, welcoming and inclusion is part of that solution, but we try and work with them to identify that for themselves, I guess, in understanding who they are and who they want to be. Great, thank you. That uh, it makes a lot of sense if you take a step back and think about the long-term vision of what you're wanting to achieve, and then if that involves migration and, as you said, who and, and how and what approach you take. So thank you for that. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, in seeing your presentation, you, you also mentioned when you finished that it's that being welcoming and inclusive is more than just raising a banner, I guess. Yeah. Uh, it's not not enough to just state that you're welcoming. Yeah. And I think it, for Kim already mentioned it, I think the the equivalent uh, equivalency to the standard in Australia would be in Canada, we have the the Canadian Coalition of Municipalities Against Racism and Discrimination, where municipalities can join and and make a commitment to ten common commitments. Um, but it, it's in some cases, uh, you know, most of those members are doing some very active work. But I would argue that some have, over time, maybe let that and it, that initiative go, and it, they're still holding on to. They still are considered a, a member, but are, they may not be active, mm -hmm. and um, and that's just a that's a challenge of, of turnover and people and priorities, and and that, that's okay. But 
So we sometimes see where municipalities do step up and they say, well, we want to do something, but it's maybe a one-time project, such as a cultural event, and these events are always certainly beneficial. But in my conversations, I'll ask, how does that event fit into the, the bigger plan? And in some cases, they may not be able to communicate that because they're so passionate about hosting that event and I haven't thought about how to build upon that. So how are you planning to help municipalities plan for a sustainable, I guess, uh, course of actions that can create some real systematic change? How will you help them plan yeah. for long-term success instead of short-term one-off projects? Yeah, I, I mean, I think this is really why we exist at all, um, and it's really kind of the gap that we're trying to fill. Um, and I absolutely agree with everything you're saying, and I think that resonates very clearly with, with, with the Australian context as well. Um, there is plenty of opportunity for banner waving through various campaigns and initiatives, which I don't diminish at all. I think they're very important. They're really important for messaging and they're really important for setting values and culture. Um, but uh, part of really what we're doing is, and it's quite dry work, it's, it's not exciting, it's not necessarily um, a, an easy sell necessarily, um, but it's really around that standard and accreditation piece and having um, kind of entry, different entry levels that councils and municipalities can, can come into so that they can begin at one point but then can aspire to continue to improve and go from established to advanced to uh, excelling to mentoring um, and, and really bring an evidence base, a, a learning platform and kind of benchmarking rigour to, to what they're doing. And so part of that for us is really mapping what they're already doing, helping uh, councils to kind of build on that existing work, but also then identifying gaps in that work and, and um, having some of the, the things that you're talking about, the, the strategies and plans, the cultural diversity and inclusion plans that, that work across everything that they do that, that aren't siloed into um, great public events or siloed into community development, but also include a focus on economic development and, and place and infrastructure um, to kind of map the skills and knowledge gaps and, and begin to really help them address that and then also help them track that progress over time. So we understand there's a lot of work behind them doing that, um, but increasingly, uh, to their absolute credit, um, local councils in Australia are really seeing the potential benefit in that and kind of seeing this as an umbrella that can kind of sit over a lot of their existing policies and practices. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on to my next question. Um, in Canada, we are in a phase of learning to reconcile some of the um, unfortunate history of how Indigenous people have been treated during uh, the colonization of, of Canada. And um, community municipalities are approaching reconciliation in, in many different ways, and there's some really, really inspiring examples at, at play. Um, one that I wanted to mention just because it, it relates around uh, migration is the city of Vancouver launched a dialogues project uh, a few years ago with the goal of connecting new immigrants with uh, local indigenous people to create that, uh, that intercultural connection. And they developed a document called First Peoples, uh, a guide for newcomers, which goes into the history and culture of indigenous people, indigenous communities local to that, to the Vancouver region. And it's designed to help new immigrants have a greater understanding of, of that culture and its importance to the Vancouver region. And I think it's a really notable initiative, and I wanted to understand how you see Australian cities connecting new immigrants with Indigenous communities to to create that more inclusive inclusive environment and to broaden the culture of of welcome in those multicultural societies. Because I, I read one of your blog posts about welcoming uh, in re in regards to the history of Indigenous communities and that and a different approach to being welcoming and wanted to get your take on that. Yeah. Yeah, look, I, I think in short, not as well as we should be. Um, th there are some cities and municipalities that are certainly uh, trying to lead the way in this space um, in, in terms of both their, their positioning and engagement of uh, traditional owners and custodians and, and Indigenous elders in their communities. Um, some of that has become quite politicised in Australia. 
at the moment around um, hashtag change the date, um, which is about uh, a bit of a move amongst a number of local councils to shift the date of the celebration of Australia Day, um, mostly out of a recognition of the uh, extreme hurt and pain that that um, is associated with in uh, Aboriginal communities, essentially on the founding of a nation that um, was based on uh, kind of an incorrect legal premise of terra nullius, that there was no one here, so they were within their rights to just come and take it over. Um, we still have a long way to go. Uh, we're yet to achieve constitutional recognition, which is uh, very topical at the moment in this country. We're yet to have a formal treaty. Um, prior to my work at Welcoming Cities, I, I've done a fair bit of work in and with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, both in urban contexts and more um, you know, regional standalone communities. And I'd really come to the conclusion in my previous work that it's going to take a significant paradigm shift, that, that we need to be willing not only to walk beside uh, First Peoples, but even more to actually be willing to walk behind, to actually be led. And I, I kind of brought this thinking to the, to the multicultural and migrant sector and to the development of welcoming cities. And, uh, and in part, I was a little bit surprised at how much of a new conversation it is in, in some kind of sections and segments. And so we've really made a very conscious decision to embed Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and communities at the front end of our standard and our work. Um, and it's being viewed probably as a little bit more innovative and cutting edge than I would like. Um, there's still very much a siloed approach to a lot of work in government um, and in Australia, and so our challenge is to kind of cut across that. I, I think the good news, though, is that um, that piece in our standard has been extremely well received um, and, and that the standard will, will really seek to kind of put some of that activity and work in place and, and really kind of frame that. Thanks. Kim, are we, how are we doing? Do we have We're good. more time for yep. Yep. Do I have another question? Or, or? Sure, please do. Sure. Okay. Um, in our work, and every time we come together as a group, we host, we'll host sometimes uh, some conferences or events, and the co most common request from those that attend the events is, we want to hear more about what other municipalities are doing. We want to understand those practical things that they're doing on a daily day basis because that helps us. And the challenge we have in doing that is a time to, for cost and travel to create that face-to-face -face networking just based on geographical challenges, which you obviously have the same challenge in your country. Um, so how do you plan to facilitate that sharing of promising practices so people have that practical examples of how they can take initiative and, and be inspired by each other? Yeah, it's, it's a challenge. <laughs> I think everyone's grappling with it. And, and some are doing some parts well and others doing other parts well. I think part of that is we've been looking around, we've been looking to the great work of Cities of Migration and the work that they do in this space uh, around uh, sharing knowledge. Um, and so um, we've kind of replicated some of that to our members in terms of conducting uh, webinars and, and video conferences, um, recognising the vast scale of our continent um, starting to convene kind of localised and regional groups of, of member cities. Um, we have an annual gathering, a national symposium, um, and we're, we're increasingly looking to online platforms, which certainly aren't a solution in and of themselves, but as part of a kind of suite of responses, I think they're useful. And I've um, become the greatest fan of uh, a relatively new uh, online platform, but an amazing startup called Apolitical. Um, possibly quite numbers of you have heard about them, apolitical.co, um, who have an amazing online platform for sharing uh, leading policy and practice across all areas in the public service and government. Um, and it's really quite phenomenal. I, I think in many ways um, it will kind of revolutionise knowledge sharing uh, for public servants. Uh, and so we're very much seeing that as a platform for our members. Um, and, and I guess it's also just a case of trying to have ex exceptional two-way com com uh, communication, which we don't often do, but um, and, and really just kind of taking a responsive and customised approach to our members based on their needs and what they need and kind of how we can best support them. Um, but we're always kind of looking 
for better ways to do that, definitely. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. You know, I am going to jump in now. Thank you very much, Aliam and, and Darren, because we have some great questions that I'd like to uh, to uh, share with the rest of you. So we've concluded the formal part of the webinar now, and it's time for our questions. Uh, I've got some great questions, and I do encourage people to continue sending their questions in. Uh, let's see how many we can get through. I will start with a question um, on a topic that you've already discussed today. Um, this comes from Vasan Arul. Jyoti, uh, who is with Regional Connections in Winkler, Canada. And he asks, what is the relationship between the Indigenous people of Australia and the newcomers in Brisbane and Australia as a whole? And, and, I, and I think we, uh, we did hear from you on that topic. Uh, in, and I, I'm, I'm embroidering a little bit here, but I think that in Canada there has been historically some pushback from our First Nations community in being uh, sort of lumped in, if you'll excuse the expression, with immigrant communities. And so I would, I'd be interested in what Aleem has to say about um, how Indigenous communities in Australia feel about um, this uh, new aligning of cultural interests. Yeah, I mean, I think it's similar for for very good reason. Um, and so the, the approach that we're very looking, very much looking at, is, is wherever possible to ensure that um, our first peoples, the traditional owners and custodians, and indigenous elders are taking more of a lead in this work, as opposed to necessarily kind of being could have placed on the same level or in, in the same grouping per se. And mm -hmm. I think that it varies. Absolutely, from city to city and municipality to municipality. I mean, when um, the first colonisers uh, or invaders, depending on which side of history you stand, um, came to this continent, there were you know 250 odd at least language groups. So there's quite a diversity of uh, a profound diversity of culture um, and quite. Uh, a detailed uh, economic system and a whole range of things that we're still trying to uncover that have in part been lost to a point quite tragically um, mm -hmm. and really begin to address. So I think it's happening better at a local level in, in local communities depending on the relationship between uh, the traditional owner groups and elder groups um, with local municipalities and various settlement agencies. Settlement agencies play a really important role in this in, a, in Australia as well in terms of bringing those stakeholders to the table. So uh, it, it's something we're grappling with and trying to do better, really, I guess is the short answer. That's great. And uh, how about you, Darren? Do you want to comment on that question? On uh, the receptivity of uh, Indigenous communities to uh, work, to work, to being uh, sort of realigned with some of the Cult, w welcome culture issues being raised by this conversation. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a tough tough one. I mentioned the Vancouver project. I'm not aware of a specific project in Alberta, mm -hmm. and I would kind of agree with your statement that I suspect that Indigenous communities wouldn't want to be suggested that they're in the same mm -hmm. box as immigrants, but at the same mm -hmm. time. A, they are both facing issues of discrimination, unfortunately, within our cultures, and so there's so much. There is there is value in um, in ensuring that they both understand uh, their respective stories, so that there is a movement towards uh, the inclusion. Mm -hmm. So I'll kind mm -hmm. of end it there on that one. That's great. No, that's very good. Thank you, Darren. I have a question now from um, here at Ryerson University from um, Jixi um, Zhuang, who asks uh, regarding migration impacts on cities. She says, could you give us some examples of how universities play a role in the welcoming landscape other than providing education and accreditation services? How do universities, how are you working with universities, Alim? Um, uh, playing a vital role, partly in providing an evidence base for, for what it is that we're looking to do and 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 why we should be doing it at all. Um, and, and so the research, uh, particularly from a number of universities, uh, University of Western Sydney, um, Monash University, Swinburne University, there's 
um, Macquarie University. There's numbers of universities in this country that are really um, doing some uh, exceptional work. University of, of South Australia in, in the kind of migration, population, social cohesion um, space. Um, some, some really leading research, both in an Australian context but also globally. And so we, we really look to universities to, to bring in academic rigour um, to what we're doing to provide that evidence base and then also to assist us in the development of um, monitoring and evaluation tools to ensure that we're also um, capturing data well and, and then reporting on, on that effectively. So it's, it's kind of see them at both ends, I guess, of, of, of the process for us. Okay, very good. Now, um, and Darren, are you working with universities in, in Alberta on, um, on your initiative? I, I suspect in the in the in the past there was probably more um, activity. Uh, since my role in this, it's more been a uh, relationship in terms of promoting uh, tools and, and information. And in particular, one we've learned of recently is the University of Alberta's. They have a a free online course uh, that that is taught about uh, Indigenous culture and history in Canada and it's taught from an indigenous perspective. So we're using that instead of us developing content or, or we're trying to steer our municipal stakeholders to to participate in that type of training. So we, we see them as a partner as, as an educator because that's not necessarily our role and, and so mm -hmm. um, we, we try to embrace that whenever we can. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, the an, an inc very important uh, institutional partner in most most communities. Uh, one that we overlook sometimes, I think. I have another question here. Um, it's a it's a long uh, uh, question, a complex question, that I'm going to try to um, summarize a bit. It comes from Alejandro Cabero, who's in Kansas City, um, addressing the work that he does with children in the city. Uh, in that particular school district, they have an extremely diverse population uh, with 48% of the children uh, with a Hispanic heritage um, and uh, many from farm worker families. And, um, and they, it's sort of wraparound services that include um, social services to the very young as well as uh, older students transitioning uh, to work. Um, his question is, is there an, an international organization or coalition of educational agencies like Welcoming Cities uh, that you're aware of that would um, be open to uh, helping uh, communities like his? But perhaps the second question uh, is more germane to our discussion today. How are Welcoming Cities ensuring that children um, are, are are, are among the stakeholders that um, your work on welcoming and inclusive communities address. How can migrant children fully benefit from the same um, free public education provided to other children? That's a tough question. How, how can I give that one to you, William? Yeah, it's probably a little bit of a different context in, in Australia in terms of public education. Um, yeah. We, broadly speaking, have quite an exceptional public education system um, in Australia. Uh, certainly could be better, um, but uh, you know, we generally most Australians enjoy access to, to free public education regardless of kind of their standing or, or circumstances. Um, so there's probably a little bit of a context issue there. However, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm aware of the work that Welcoming America is doing around welcoming schools. So I'm not sure if uh, Alejandro is aware of that work. Um, but also, um, in, in terms of our work, probably some of our work has tended to focus more on young people as opposed to children specifically, uh, working with uh, great organisations like the Centre for Multicultural Youth who do great work in this country and, and some of the numbers of the settlement agencies who do a lot of work with, with children and young people as well. Um, but also because our work is, is more focused on uh, local government, um, it, their service delivery varies. So some local governments uh, do deliver childcare centres, some have responsibility for um, uh, uh, distance education and alternative education units. So depending on their needs will depend on our level of engagement with that. 
Um, but one of our partners, the Scanlon Foundation, um, uh, supports the work of Community Hubs Australia, which is taking a really uh, possibly similar approach to the work that you're doing, uh, Alejandro, around um, embedding uh, work in schools across this country and a lot of public schools. Um, and so they, they'd be worth looking at. I'm not aware of an international organisation, but it's not to say that they're not out there. Um, would, Community Hubs Australia would be, would be worth looking at as well. Um, yeah. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you very much. Um, I've got two quick questions, both of them around um, issues of accountability. Um, one, uh, come in, our Twitter feed asks how you hold your members accountable. And uh, the related question is, of course, um, re uh, how did you, were you, why and how were you able to engage Deloitte um, in, uh, in your work? Um, so in terms of accountability, the, the standard and accreditation process is really a critical um, aspect of that for us. It's not a requirement that councils in joining the Welcoming Cities Network necessarily have to go through the standard and accreditation process. However, they can't, um, I guess, call themselves uh, a welcoming city unless they have. Um, and then the ongoing uh, process of assessment and accreditation is really where we see um, the majority of the accountability. I mean, in committing to the network, they really commit to the values and the principles of what it is that we're trying to do collectively. But we very much see the standard accreditation process as really kind of that ultimate level of benchmarking and rigor and accountability. Um, in terms of Deloitte, um, uh, they've been doing some interesting work, uh, particularly through Deloitte Access Economics in, in researching the the impacts of migration um, and cultural diversity and inclusion in uh, regional and rural uh, municipalities, particularly smaller municipalities. And the case study I mentioned in my presentation around the city of Nil, spelled N-H-I-L-L, -L, um, which I'd be happy to share with people, um, was quite an extensive research project that Deloitte undertook um, off their own back, basically, to, to really highlight the significant strengths and economic strengths of uh, migration settlement and inclusion. Um, and so um, through various relationships, we uh, approached them aware of that work and, and really wanting someone who was kind of sitting outside us to just do some of the initial work so we could free ourselves of any potential um, biases that we might have had, that we might have been bringing to the work. We felt it was initially important to bring in someone outside to kind of take a bigger picture approach. Um, and they agreed, and, and they did it um, pretty much at almost at no cost for us, at quite a significantly subsidised uh, fees because they just kind of believed in the value of the work. So it was great to have them involved. Oh, that's wonderful. In fact, that, that uh, work has been profiled at Cities Migration. For, for those of you who are interested, it's, it's excellent. And in fact, it's a refugee population, if I'm not mistaken, that was studied, which yes, makes it right. all the more yeah. uh, apropos these days. Um, I have uh, one more question that I'd like to quickly um, give you both. Um, this is from L L L Joseph Libin, who's with uh, HR Inclusion. Uh, uh, for the city of Brooks in Alberta. Um, he comments on uh, um, uh, the number of studies that showcase the positive impact of immigration as well as the cost of doing nothing. Um, and, but I think what he's really, what, what the question, he's making a comment, but I think the question that we would, I think is, would be really worth asking both of you is is how you are sharing the work you're doing with the wider community, given the importance of, of understanding these issues better and their enormous potential to, to, to tackle some of the issues of discrimination and racism um, that, that we're dealing with these days. So um, are, maybe, maybe you, Aleem, you can tell us about how you're sharing some of this work with the wider community. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I absolutely agree with um, the statements there, I, I think, um, uh, yes, if we don't address issues now, it could provide an opportunity for discrimination to fester. Um, I, I think the short answer is as widely as possible by as many means as possible, <laughs> um, uh, whether it's at conferences, forums, online, social media, um, the, the organisation that our initiative sits within, uh, Welcome to Australia, um, has 
you know, quite a, a significant and large social media presence, um, uh, particularly for, for an NGO, so 130,000 active followers. Um, and so we're really just by any means possible, by, um, whether that's speaking, whether that's writing articles and blog posts, um, which Darren was kind enough to mention, uh, through to sharing research, uh, through to making sure that uh, as many decision makers as possible um, have access to that information as well, and not just um, people who have a specific, maybe kind of media or political agenda. So yeah, that's probably the short answer. That's great. So, and indeed, one last question. I lied. So this one has just come in from, it's a very good question, from Amel Garby. She comments, uh, who is from Montreal, she comments that um, she'd like to hear more about how you've involved the participation of immigrants themselves as stakeholders in, in the Welcoming Cities Initiative. Um, and actually, it's a great question for both of you in your work. How have you involved immigrants um, as stakeholders in the work? Um, we've done that primarily at this stage through uh, peak bodies, but also local focus groups. So um, the Federation of Ethnic Communities Council of Australia, the Settlement Council of Australia, and the Refugee Council of Australia have, have been fantastic supporters of our work. And, and mm -hmm. so um, we've basically uh, left it to them to distribute that to their members uh, as far and as widely as possible, which they, they've done uh, fantastically. And then also um, more localised uh, forums and conferences in communities, um, basically inviting community stakeholders to those uh, conversations and talking about the work that we're looking to do with, with local councils. Oh. And how about you, um, Darren, in, in, uh, in your work? Uh, well, our discussions are primarily with the municipal leaders. Not uh, We tend to partner with a lot of uh, immigration-based uh, organizations. Each municipality certainly, um, depending on the local assets they have in place, are are engaging. Uh, there's a, a strong movement in Alberta and across Canada where they're developing local immigration partnerships. And each municipality, uh, each community has a different approach. But I know through that work there's a large amount of consultation and involvement with immigrant communities to be participate on those councils and on those committees, and uh, that opens up a wide, a greater understanding of the challenges of the, of the local immigrant community that, that may not have been uh, known to the municipality unless they were being very uh, diligent in their consultation processes. Mm -hmm. um, but we just, I was just at an event on the weekend where the city of Calgary was talking about them developing um, new park space and what the needs were, and they talked about taking a very active approach to going to mosques and going to uh, local organizations to directly ask them instead of expecting the immigrant community to come to the city. And so I think that's a really promising practice that they had some great success on. It was great to hear that story. So. Yeah. Well, that's great. I think that's a perfect uh, note uh, uh, to close our today's session. Uh, to to hear about the way uh, you know every all constituents in the community are being engaged uh, around how we design and 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 uh, think about the inclusive cities that we uh, all want to live in. So we've we've reached the uh, we're now at the end of our Q and A. Um, I always like the the privilege of asking the very last question, but I'm not. I just want a very short answer. Um, I'd like to ask each of you, um, to, you know, in a in a word or two, what your next Big idea is what you're, you're what what you're looking forward to to doing in the next uh, little while. As maybe we'll start with you, Aleem. What's what's the next big move in your agenda? Uh, the next big move in my agenda really kind of speaks to one of Darren's questions around how we share more effectively with our members in our network, um, and and so really ramping up this platform that I mentioned. Um, to ensure that we're both showcasing the great work that, that's coming out of our country, but also uh, communicating that as practically um, as possible to, to all our members. That's great. And how about how about you, Darren, and the wonderful work you do with your Welcoming Inclusive Communities Network? What's your next big move? 
Uh, I would say we have two big ones. We are developing a, an agenda for a two-day conference, inclusion conference, scheduled for the spring. Uh, we're really looking forward to that. And then the second is our measuring inclusion tool, which was, was briefly mentioned, which is a, a benchmarking tool similar to the standard and, and uh, the benchmarking process that Ali mentioned. Ours is, um, is developed, it's available, and we're really uh, focusing on promoting the value of that and been showcasing the ease of use that that tool offers at, at different um, workshops and, and conferences that I've been attending. Oh, that's great. Well, I look forward to, to hearing more about that and following both um, your work in the future. Thank you very much, um, both of you. Um, our time has run out. Um, on behalf of all of our participants, the Cities of Migration team here at the Global Diversity Exchange, I'd like to thank Ali Ali from Brisbane and Darren Reedy from Edmonton for a brilliant exchange of ideas. To our audiences and cities of migration everywhere, I'd like you to imagine this wonderful work being interpreted in your city or adapted by your organization or changing the neighborhood that you live in. We'd like to hear your stories and share more good practices, so please um, stay connected.